Warning, today's episode contains singing. Listener discretion is advised. Uh, Big, before we start the uh, show, do you remember how a couple weeks ago I was asking for people to, to send us music? Oh, yeah. Okay, somebody sent us a theme tune to the October Scary Story event. Really? Are you serious? Yes. Okay, ready? Okay, here we go. October, October's scary, October's very, very near, if you feel fear, October Scary Story Event. Isn't that great that somebody did that, man? I was just thinking, I mean, just out of the goodness of their own hearts that somebody's obviously very, very Hey, talented. Rish. Yeah. Did somebody send this to us? It was created by someone for us, yes. Rish, this is your song, isn't it? Well, I, I like to think that it's our our song. Rish, seriously, man. Is this something you expect us to use for all the October Scary Story event shows? Well, we, we could ask announcer, man. Sure. Uh, what do you think, announcer man? Is this a song we should use? No. Well, hey, it's it's either this theme or no theme at all. Yeah. Uh, my vote is no theme at all. I think I hear your mama calling you, Rish. <laughs> And they finally pulled the body from the twisted, burning wreck. It looked just like this. <laughs> Welcome to the Dunes Thief Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 3, page 48. Not bad. We may have to use these when it's actually October, those voices. That'll be cool. Yeah, that doesn't it suck that it's, <laughs> it's the end of February and we're calling it October. And then what's worse is we've got a story coming up. It's going to be March. We're calling it October, and the story is called Halloween in July. <laughs> this is great. <sighs> oh, sorry. The camera is rolling. Uh, I am Beastly Big Anklevich. And I am revolting, Rish Outfield. Wait, wait re- revolting? <laughs> wait, can I, do, can I do it over? No, no, we're already through that. And our last host is Ominous O8OT. <laughs> huh. hmm. Today's October scary story is Megan's Bridge <laughs> by Amanda Crumb. <laughs> Amanda Crum is a 20-something stay-at-home mom from Kentucky. Her first novel, The Fireman's Daughter, was recently published and is available on Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com. Today's story is read for us by Liz Mirzievsky. I'm hoping I said that right. I think I did. Liz, thanks for the help. Megan's Bridge by Amanda Crum. She sat and watched her classmates from her spot on the swing set as they chased one another around the playground, laughing and yelling, catcalling to one another. It was mostly the boys who did this, possibly because it was a Friday and they were almost delirious with the prospect of the forthcoming weekend, but mostly, Megan thought, because they were 12 and 13 year old boys who were a raging mass of testosterone and felt it their duty to rank out as many mother's sisters as they could. Hey, Joe, who's that skank I saw your brother with at the Dairy Queen last night? What, you didn't recognize your own sister? The eighth grade boys were the worst, she thought disgustedly. Always talking dirty and fighting. The only reason they were getting along so well today was because their teacher, Mrs. Vaughn, was out sick, and substitutes meant a free day. Subs never knew what to do with them. They were too difficult to control. They were a small band of misfits, 
a group of 6th, 7th, and 8th graders who had been labeled as emotional problems by the school guidance counselors. The progressive school was in its fourth year with the breezily titled Discoveries Program, which kept Megan and her classmates mostly separated from the other children during the week. It was as if, she thought now with a sneer, the school officials were afraid that their emotional problems were contagious and wanted to keep the normal kids from getting infected. On Fridays, the Discoveries group ate lunch with the other kids and shared one class, which happened to be Art, Megan's favorite. She pushed off from the soft, sandy dirt beneath her and pumped her legs to make the swing move higher, closing her eyes as she felt the summer air magically grow cooler against her skin as it picked up with her movement. She was looking forward to art today, especially since she had finished the charcoal piece she had started the week prior. She couldn't wait to show it to Mr. Ashby, the only teacher at Progressive, who seemed to give a damn about her or her schoolwork. This was a big part of the reason she loved our class so much. But it didn't hurt that he was unfailingly cute, she thought with a little smile playing at her lips. Dark hair that fell over his left eye when he was really concentrating on his work. Soft, liquid brown eyes that seemed to see into her soul. She would miss him when she moved out next year to high school. Her art skills had really taken a turn for the better under his tutelage, she reflected. Especially over the last few weeks. But this last piece, it was a real corker and she couldn't let Mr. Ashby take all the credit for it, even though he had been good enough to inspire her on more than one occasion. A glance through her sketchbook would tell anyone who cared to look that he was her favorite teacher. He was the subject of 90% of the drawings inside. Lately, she'd had other inspirations, however. Dark things. Things that went bump in the night and scratched at windows with sharp, unrelenting fingers. She had even had nightmares a few times, but dreams came and went, and so she pushed the fear away to the back of her mind and went with whatever her thoughts threw at her. She'd bought a new sketchbook for those inspirations, though. It wouldn't do for just anyone to see what she had been pulling out of thin air. Hey, Megan! She jerked as though out of a trance and turned to see Bryce Ellington, the biggest meathead jock in the school, standing behind her with two of his football-playing lackeys. I heard you were a witch. Why don't you cast a spell to make them titties puff out of that dress? She watched as he and his buddies nearly collapsed with the force of his wit, her eyes narrowed to small, dark slits. Several of her classmates had taken to calling her witch and goth girl lately because of a new fondness for the color black. She'd even dyed her hair to match her clothes, a particularly violent shade that had undertones of blue running through it. It made her naturally fair skin appear to be even more pale, but she liked the way it shone in the sun like the underside of a crow's wing, like something pretty. And now these assholes were ruining her good thoughts and her peace by making fun of her. She smiled sweetly at the boys and said the first thing that came to mind, something she had taken to doing since discovering her new talent. Fear didn't cloud her mind for once. It was nice. Maybe I can cast a spell to make your dick bigger. My grandmother said she can hardly feel it. There was a moment of absolute silence before the other boys burst out laughing, <laughs> doubling over with the force of it. The sound was harsh and jangling, even among the voices of the other kids on the playground, and some of them stopped what they were doing to crane their necks for a better view at what was going on. What did you say to me, bitch? Bryce asked softly, disbelievingly. His fists curled into themselves at his side. Megan still did not feel threatened. You heard me. Distantly, she could hear someone ask one of the lackeys what had happened, and him replaying the conversation thus far. Cruel laughter drifted over to her, past Bryce, who was working up a pretty good head of steam, judging by the blush rising from his collar. His pride had been wounded, and worse than that, it had been wounded by a girl. She could almost feel the anger coming off him in waves. But she did not apologize, and she did not back down. The bell rang, signaling the end of free time. Soon the kindergartners would be arriving in bright, noisy clusters, chaperoned by their pretty young teacher, Miss Abel. The older kids began to break up, moving slowly back up to the school buildings in groups of twos and threes. Megan kept her eyes locked with Bryce, who was flaring his nostrils like a bull. It was a funny sight, and she expected white 
plumes of steam to escape his ears at any moment, but she didn't dare laugh at him. That would be pushing her luck, and she knew it. Come on, man, let's go. We're going to be late, one of the lackeys said, tugging on Bryce's shirt sleeve. Yeah, you know what Mrs. McCorvey said, the other lackey said, already walking toward the school. I mean, one more tardy and we get a three-day suspension. I can't afford that shit, man. I'm already in probation with my old man. Bryce stood where he was, fists clenching and unclenching in a fit of rage. This bitch. Forget her, man. Let's go. He seemed torn for a moment, looking back and forth between his friends and Megan, who was still smiling sweetly from her spot on the swing. I'll get you, slut, he said finally. His voice seemed raw with the effort of holding back a scream. And Megan glanced up at the school building where the monitor was waiting for them with a glare on his sour, unforgiving face. If it's the last thing I do, I'll get you. He walked slowly away, seeming to lurch along on stiff legs. He was so angry, his entire body bore the brunt of it, Megan thought with amusement. There was something familiar about his gait. She tilted her head for a moment in the bright sunshine, trying to figure out what it was. And then it hit her. He looked like her new friend. The thought made her smile, and she stood and stretched slowly in the heat of the day like a lazy cat before making her way back up to the school. He would get her. Yeah, right. The creek that ran along Clay's Mill Road babbled incessantly as Megan walked home, her constant companion. She switched her backpack from her left shoulder to her right and breathed in deep of the day. It smelled like honeysuckle and of the tiny purple blossoms that grew on the side of the road, more weed than actual flower. Yet there was another smell mixed in, she thought, as she neared the short wooden bridge that would take her to Briggs Ferry. It was a dark and hungry scent that reminded her of the way old barns smelled in the summer, like wild beasts and meat and fecal matter. She knew what that smell meant. He was here, her friend. She walked to the bridge and bent to look over at the stream, hoping he was in a friendly mood today. The water ran clear and unfettered over rocks and sand, making a soft gurgling noise that almost masked the sound of footsteps behind her. She turned slowly as the shadow crept up over hers and smiled. Hello, Bryce. Don't hello me, bitch, Bryce said softly. The gel in his hair gleamed dully in the sunshine, spiking the strands so that they looked like the teeth of a razor. I told you I'd get you, and I keep my promises. Megan smiled even broader and unshouldered her backpack, dropping it to the wooden floor of the bridge with a heavy thud. Ah, come on, Bryce, I was only kidding. You can dish it out, but you can't take it. He stepped forward until they were nose to nose. His eyes were bottomless black pits, only bare centimeters from hers. Listen. Wait, she said softly. I don't want to fight. I'm sorry. You can stuff your fucking sorries in a sack. She tried to back away, but the railing of the bridge was already at her hip, and she only succeeded in digging it in even further. He followed, leaning in so close to her that she was actually partially bent over the bridge backwards. Look, Bryce, I, I want to make a peace offering. I I'll let you touch me. That stopped him in his tracks. It was what she had been hoping for, what she had placed all her chips on, that the simple fact that he was a warm-blooded male would get in the way of his anger for a moment. What do you mean? Is this some kind of trick? He took a step back and looked at her with his brow furrowed in suspicion. No, no, no trick, she assured him. Just think of it as an apology on my part. He looked around them like a thief about to jimmy the lock on a car door and cracked his knuckles. She watched his tongue snake out to wipe perspiration from his upper lip and thought how good it would be, how good he would be. Where? He asked in a low voice. She smiled and took his hand gently. It was a big hand for an eighth grade boy, rough and calloused with farm work and from the endless days on the football field in weather, both fair and foul. Anywhere you want, she said, and he grunted. Mm. It was close as she would get to a consent from him, she understood. He would never admit the need was there, the want. 
especially since it was for her, the girl who was not only considered a freak among freaks, but who had shamed him in front of his buddies. He let her guide his hand to the front of her dress, and then he took over, unbuttoning the bodice just enough so that her bra peeked out. It was white cotton, sensible for the summer heat. She felt a tremor go through him, and he sighed at the feel of the material, oh. his eyes never moving from those small buds sheathed in cotton, from the hint of promise. He was so engrossed in what was in front of him that he did not hear the thing behind him. It was her friend, the one she had sketched a portrait of a week ago. He looked just as she had drawn him on that day, huge and misshapen, with a great mass of black hair that grew in a natural mohawk on top of his head and continued down his back. His hands had gotten so much stronger, she noticed, almost twice the size of how she'd drawn them. He must have been building up his strength while she was away at school. She felt a twinge of sorrow at having left him alone for so long, but the time had gotten away from her after that first drawing was finished, and she hadn't been able to come visit the way she'd promised she would. But she was hoping that her little gift would appease him. Bryce saw the shadow fall over both of them before he heard the beast and turned slowly around as if it was in a dream. Perhaps he thought he was, Megan thought. He certainly would before it was over. Rather, he would hope it was a dream, a nightmare. The beast reared its head back and let loose a primal scream toward the heavens. And what Megan hoped was delight, balling up its fist before grabbing Bryce by the throat and picking him up effortlessly. The boy screamed thinly as though he had asthma or perhaps his windpipe had been crushed. Megan didn't know or care. She buttoned up her dress and re-shouldered her backpack as the beast placed Bryce carefully in its mouth, the way a mama cat will do one of her kittens, and moved back to its spot beneath the bridge. Long, ropey bands of muscle moved across its back, and she wondered just how strong her creation had gotten during its time alone. It certainly didn't seem to have any trouble with its dinner, she thought, smiling down over the bridge. Bryce was still clamped at its mouth, and he appeared to be breathing, but she couldn't tell for certain from this distance. At any rate, his eyes were glazed and dead. Blood spilled from the gashes in his side where the beast's teeth had torn through the flesh. His throat had a bruised, thick look about it that reminded Megan of her brother's pet snake and the way his body bulged after eating a mouse. That's for you, she said softly to her friend. All for you. I'll bring you more when I can, okay? The beast looked up with the boy dangling from its lips. The feral eyes seemed to glow in the dim light under the bridge. But whether out of happiness with her or annoyance, she couldn't tell. She decided not to stick around to find out. The next day at school, the rumors flew. Bryce hadn't shown up for school, of course, and the kids were all gleaning their own explanations as to why. His father, who was a well-known drunk in their small town, had beaten him for some infraction and finally gone too far and killed him. He'd been too ashamed to show his face at school after what Megan had said on the playground. Megan really was a witch, after all, and had put a spell on him, rendering him unable to use his arms and legs and therefore unable to show up at school, ensuring his suspension. Megan didn't care what they said. She took her sketchbook to the art room during free period when she knew Mr. Ashby would be working on his latest project. He had been working with Clay lately, and she found him sitting at the potter's wheel, staring intently at the blob of reddish mud slung out before him. Mr. Ashby? He turned to her with a smile, and she couldn't help but reciprocate. It was contagious, that smile, and it gave her the courage to show him what she had brought with her. Hello, Megan. Why aren't you out with the others, enjoying the day? She stepped forward and handed him the sketchbook, almost reverently, as though making an offering of some kind. And, in a way, she thought, she was. He was the one person who understood her, the one person who would get her drawings and see them for what they were. Together, they could create anything they wanted, a world of their own in which the progressive school and people like Bryce Ellington didn't exist. He took the book from her without a word and flipped it open to the first drawing. 
The beast seemed to leap from the page, grotesque red eyes bulging, mohawk razor straight and sharp like the quills of a porcupine. The muscles in its forearms bunched and knotted together like thin snakes, a mass of tendon and flesh that looked made for tearing and destroying. It stood just under the bridge in the drawing, rendered here in charcoal and broad strokes from an ebony pencil. It was ugly, she thought, looking at the drawing over Mr. Ashby's shoulder. But it was hers. Megan, Mr. Ashby began. She looked at him hopefully, sure that what he was about to say would change their lives forever. This is a departure for you, isn't it? I didn't think you cared much for this fairy tale stuff. Megan's smile faltered. To watch it was much like watching a cloud pass over the sun. His expression was not what she'd imagined. He didn't look impressed or happy for her at all. In fact, he looked rather sick to his stomach. He held the sketchbook by his thumb and forefinger as though he didn't want to touch it any more than he had to. Suddenly, Megan smiled again. It was a bright, brilliant smile that Mr. Ashby found contagious, despite his reservations against the drawing, and he returned it with fervor. I'm sorry you don't like it, Megan said, still smiling, but maybe you could walk me home today and let me show you the bridge from the sketch. It was very inspiring. There were strict school policies against fraternizing with students outside of school grounds, but Mr. Ashby agreed reluctantly. It would be wrong to deny such a small request, especially coming from Megan, who showed such promise as an artist. He couldn't put his finger on it, but she had something, some unexplainable glimmer behind those big, dark eyes. Besides, what harm could it do? Author's note. I wrote Megan's Bridge as payback of sorts to the jocks at my high school who tormented me because I was an art freak who wore black most of the time. Aside from the fact that I didn't have my own monster to do my bidding, Megan is very much like me, creative, tormented by meatheads who secretly want her, and wielding a dangerous imagination. And although my high school days ended a frightening 11 years ago, Writing about Megan and her abilities was cathartic for me. I guess old scars run deep. But that's the beauty of all forms of art. Us freaks can pour out our demons onto the canvas or the page and then go have a beer. I don't know that I can say the same for everyone else. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that story. I did. I guess it's time to give that a rest, huh? It's time to give many things a rest, I think. If I could get my listener in a room, I would ask him, is he sick to death of the the, the R-O-T stuff? Is he sick to death of uh, definitions? The Steve uh, definitions? The hate letter of the week. Okay, welcome back. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I was, I was miles away. <laughs> sorry. Again, we wanted to thank Liz for uh, reading that story for us. Great job, Liz, thank you. Even if you do have an unpronounceable last name. Mirzieski, you mean? Why do you got to do that, man? <laughs> I just said it was unpronounceable. It was kind of a joke. I mean, it wasn't funny, but it was a joke. Uh-huh. Also, somebody did a drawing for the story... Of uh, the, 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 the creature, the beast, the... the, the yeah, the, the, good the, drawing, the... huh? You know, I'll bet it's on the... It's on the site, yes. Okay, so, so I want to thank um, whoever that person was. I, I, I don't that know... That was your... Liz Mirzieski that... No, no, the no, no, the, the, the drawing. Right. No, Liz M. read the story <laughs> for us. Uh-huh. But I'm talking about this. somebody gave us a drawing. Uh-huh. I mean, it should be on there. Can, it's can on we there. surf the... Yeah, can yeah, I write... Do you see, see that? that? Okay, that picture... Right there. That's what I'm talking about. Not I, Liz, I love you, but I'm talking about the person who drew that. Yeah, that Thank was you. Liz. Mirzieski Would you stop? Drew. Yes, I know who Liz is. I heard her voice. She's uh-huh. just read the story. Hopefully the she people... She draws very well. She's talented. Multi-talented, okay. as they say. Then you made a Triple mistake. Triple threat, I think she also writes. What are you talking about? Triple threat. I will triple <laughs> threat you in the spine, man. The The girl... Who read the story is Liz Mirzieski. Uh-huh. Mirzieski. 
Right. But the girl, there was a girl who, who drew something. She, out of the kindness of her uh-huh. spleen, drew a picture. Right, Liz Merzieski. It was not, it, it was of Megan's Bridge. Uh-huh. Oh, wait. That's why she You're drew You're confusing it. Amanda Crumb with Liz Majeski, right? <laughs> Amanda no, Crumb wrote, wrote the story. Liz Mirzieski Liz read the story, read the and story. then she said, Hey, I'd really like to draw a picture. Maybe replicate the picture that the character in the story did. No, no, dude, nobody And I is said, That, that would be awesome. It and was... so she did it. And I was like, Whoa, that's great. And she's like, Yeah, I hope you like it. Hope Rish understands that I drew it, not somebody else. And I said, Yeah, I'll make sure he knows. Okay, A, I doubt that you ever had this conversation. And two, close. if this girl is actually that talented, then I need to meet this person. Okay. I, you know what? I, I also need to make her a friend on oh, Facebook. Yes, you do. <laughs> I, good luck on that, though. She only is friends with cool people like me. <laughs> but yes, Facebook, good stuff, huh? You know what? I'm, I'm not only going to ask her to be my friend. I'm going to ask her to be my woman friend. Um... I think she's married, man. Wait, you're telling me Majizuski is her married man? <laughs> How handsome would this dude have to have been? <laughs> oh, So, yeah, as you can tell from Rish's uh, strange continual fascination, is he, he keeps coming back to this Facebook thing. We have uh, finally given in, and we are now on Facebook. Don't you two have anything better to do? Shut up, announcer, man. Well, hey, so, so last episode you talked about this whole Facebook phenomenon uh-huh. and that people could be fans of the Dune Steve and all that. Right. And I didn't have an account. So uh, just a couple of days ago, I think like 50 hours ago, I created this Facebook page and I, I uploaded a picture and it asks you what you like. And I put that in but to make a long story short, like seven hours later, <laughs> I got up from the computer. Luckily I had two pairs of depends on. Yeah, good. But the next day, which was yesterday, I was like, oh, I got to upload a ton of pictures. And, oh, I'm going to mark who is in every single one of these pictures. And, oh, I think I have some old pictures that I need to scan. And, dude, what a gigantic time waster. Now, no offense <laughs> if you love Facebook. And I'm not even saying it's a bad thing. But I'm just saying that I had a weekend. Then I <laughs> discovered Facebook. And then it was Monday. You know, I've always like, always tried to avoid all these sort of sites. I stayed away from MySpace, which eventually I finally joined as the Dune Steve. That's me. I'm the Dune Steve. Rish Outfield is on there as Rish Outfield. I am the Dune Steve. Cuckoo-cachoo. Then I, again, tried to avoid Facebook. My wife gets on that thing all the time, spends all her time looking up all her old friends. And I'm just like, what is the point of all of this? And here I am doing it. But it's fun. You know, it's it's interesting. I think it's really cool to become friends with the listeners and get an idea of who these people may be. Well, and... see, I I don't have a wife. Uh-huh, because you're gay? No, it, it just I don't have one. So I didn't have an excuse to not get on Facebook before now. But, yeah, I got to admit, it's like really fun or it's addictive or I kept pushing the little, it's not a refresh button, but there's a status button or something like that to see, oh, if, if somebody new has changed something or said, you know, that I am no longer sleeping. And it's just one of those things where, oh, geez. But it was cool uh, to have a couple of people ask if I would be their friend. I mean, it almost felt... Like I did have a friend yeah, for once. That would be. Come on, away, Odie. Thanks. Play that music. And I know that it's not real, that it's just, you know, imaginary on the website. <laughs> but I'd like to think that if we ever met at like a mall, that we could maybe. <laughs> Thanks, away, Odie. I, you know, I, I hate that robot. If our away, Odie were, were on Facebook, and he sent me a friend request. You'd accept it. Come on, admit it. No, I, I would not accept it. He is a tool, all right? No, nah, he's more of like a application, like a program. I promise you, if R08OT sent you a friend request, or someone pretending to be R08OT, you would accept that thing in a heartbeat. I respectfully disagree. <clears throat> uh-huh. So anyhow, we are on Facebook. That's right. The Dune Steef Audio Fiction Magazine. Just feel so bad at these poor people that have to see our pictures on there. <laughs> We're also on MySpace if you 
swing that way. We do check in on that one fairly often as well. So you're also on MySpace? Yes. As I, the Dune Steve? I am the Dune Steve. Chingasolator. Yes, the Chingasolator. That's me doing robotic arm movements for all you listener at home. Vroom, vroom, party starter. What is this? Oh, you know what? Announcer man, probably. I'll bet that guy's already on. <laughs> he probably <laughs> is. Uh-huh. He's already got 100,000 friends. He's on my face. Wait, that sounded wrong. I was trying to combine MySpace and Facebook, and it just came out, he's on my face. Yikes. Uh, huh? He's an no old wonder you man don't too. have a wife. Nice one. Oh, that's so wrong. Are we the T? Are we the Oh, come on. Please cut it out. So, yeah, if you like MySpace, Facebook, jump on there. You can uh, introduce yourself to us. There is even some, like, discussion-type forum things that you can do on That's there right. as well. That's right. Sudden Death Nicole has done wonders on there. Yes. Dang. But, uh, yeah, if you want to leave a comment there, you can do that. There's also the standard form of leaving comments. You can just go to our blog page at www.doonsteve.com, and you can leave a comment on the blog. Works for me. Okay, so this was the second of our October Scary Story event. Uh -huh. And in case you're just joining us, little Melissa was trapped at the bottom of the well and forced to gnaw off her left foot. And now she's moving to the right. That is a voracious little girl. No, Tim, uh, what I was going to say is, back in September, I posed the challenge to our listeners to send us a scary story during the month of October that they wrote during the month of October. And that we would read the finalists on the air. So this one by Amanda Crum uh, is the second one that we've done. That's right. There's four altogether, two still to come. Um, this one was a good one, I thought. I liked it a lot because, you know, I was, I was picked on a lot by bullies when no, I was No, you weren't. That was me. Give me my script back. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I was able to relate to this story because I was picked on by bullies as a kid. And so I... As a I, kid? All right, six months ago. But I, you know, every time I get in front of you, I am picked on by a bully. But it, I was able to relate to Megan, and uh, it sure would have been nice to have a troll monster to just get my back. So that was cool. I'm really excited about how this story turned out with a great reading. We had a really exciting guest reader who drew us a picture. No, she didn't. And the picture was excellent. It was really good. So if you enjoyed this episode, remember, uh, we do pay our authors. We pay them with money. Very little money. Yes. It's several coins scraped together, whatever I happen to have. And we give them lint. And that money has to come from somewhere. And since the advertisers aren't lining up just yet, uh, we depend on listener donations to pay our authors with. We have a little button on our website. It's a PayPal button. You press the button. I press the button. And you get to give all your hard-earned cash to us. Yes, all. So we'd like to thank everyone who's donated so far. It's, you know, really helped us out a lot. But we're still holding the microphones. True. What, where, what have you been spending this money on? Uh, like I said, we pay our authors. Well, then... Don't stop paying our authors. I want some kind authors of microphone send stand. Send us free stories because Rish wants a microphone stand, and that's more important than you. Have you ever seen my arms? Jack Skellington looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger compared to me. I can't carry this microphone. So we've been doing these things. You know, we've been saying, hey, I'm going to punch Rish in the stomach if somebody doesn't donate. Well, you know, I think we've been going about it all wrong. We tell people we'll reward them. Yeah, more like humiliate me in some way. Like I said, if there are no donations, figuring, hey, we never get donations, so we're safe. Well, that does seem wrong somehow. So how about we go the opposite from now on? Oh, and punish you rather than me? That sounds great. No, uh, we'll just do stuff if we get donations rather than if we don't. For example, I was thinking uh, we could make some content that's just for people who donate. Well, is there ever content on our show? I didn't say quality content. All right, what did you have in mind? Well, you and I write some stories too, right? Maybe we could put a couple of our stories out there for people who donate. As a reward? Well, as bonus content, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm not really comfortable with putting myself out there. You humiliate yourself each and every day, dude. It's really the only thing that you're good at. 
but suppose I, I put my stories up, like you say, and, and somebody didn't like them. What if they read my story and, and decided never to donate again, or, or, or they asked for their donation back? All right. Well, the other idea was to hurt you. Uh, the more somebody donates, the more pain you'll be in. For example, a $5 donation is worth a punch in your gut. $10 would be to the face. 15 I break a finger. You know, uh, we, we both wrote October Scary Stories. Uh, maybe we could post those on there. Right, or stuff we've done in the past. You know, like before we actually started this podcast, we actually recorded some of our own stories, and they're ready to go. People can listen to them. But I don't know how high the quality Well, the quality is not especially great, but... Well, if, if you hear the first couple episodes, the stories, you can hear that hum from that terrible microphone I still use. And I used to record all those things. True. They're not great quality, but I think people would still enjoy them. I think it would be better than just saying, hey, thanks for the donation and screw you. So that's what you've been doing with this? <laughs> hey, screw you, man. Yeah. It's not helping to get return donations, unfortunately. I think I may have to change that strategy up, too. Well, that, you know, that might work. You know, maybe the listeners could. Listener. Right. Maybe the listener can tell us what he thinks. I'll ask for comments. We'll see what John Smith has to say. We were. What were we going to talk about in this episode? How about that dollhouse, huh? That's 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 right. Okay, so that has premiered. And uh, what did you think, announcer man? Did you like the show? Joss Whedon is my master now. I take it that means yes. You you enjoyed it? I don't know. I'm just an announcer. What did you think, Rish? You know, I I don't know. I watched it. <laughs> I will Good. continue Good. to watch it. But honestly, I think my favorite part of the whole episode was the little Gur Arg guy popping up at the end. So not a high opinion of it then, huh? You're going to keep watching. Well, because Joss Whedon is my master also. Oh, also. okay. I'm certainly more willing to watch next week's episode because that was the actual first episode. That was the actual pilot that Joss made. Uh -huh. And Fox didn't like it. And they ordered a new pilot the same way they did with Firefly. At least they're showing his pilot. And you know, by the time this episode airs, that pilot will also have aired. Was, so that makes the first episode a prequel, huh? It's a dollhouse it, prequel. It is. I guess <laughs> Fox watched what he had made and they said, well, we're confused. How did everybody meet or how did they all get there? Well, they still didn't really solve that. I mean, they show you Echo and she it's before she's Echo. She's just, what's her name? Caroline or something. I don't know. Uh, didn't you call her Faith? I called her Faith because that's who she is on Buffy oh, the Vampires. That's right. Yeah, so they show her before she's Echo, just that one scene at the very, very start. And then after that, she wakes up and she's Echo. And it seems like that wasn't the first time that she's had her mind wiped. Actually, I guess she doesn't just wake up. They show her like riding the motorcycles around and all that stuff. So that's your introduction. So she's already doing her job. And who knows if that's her first job or she's been at it for three years or you, you, know, you don't know. And obviously, they're going to reveal more and more about that kind of stuff as time goes by. And I think we're going to know a lot more about Echo uh, and what got her into the situation of being Echo because they hint a lot about, oh, yeah, your actions have consequences. But what if they didn't? Yes. So we'll find out, I suppose, on, on that stuff. Yeah, and I didn't hate the episode. I liked that part at the very beginning where we uh -huh. see her before and she has the option. I guess these are volunteers because, you know, I got the impression later on that, that where they were slaves or that they were, they were, well, was white slavery people being shipped over here and turned into actives? Is that yeah, it? that's the lead that Tamo is chasing, whatever his name is. His character's name is, I don't remember, but Tamo is chasing the whole white slavery thing. I think that may be another, that may be a red herring that's out there for us. You know, ultimately, this episode may be less important or less integral to the whole than all the other episodes because it is it is a prequel. It's a, prequel. It's a yeah. literal prequel where they make it after. You know, they did that on Firefly. They had a prequel episode that showed how everybody met and all that stuff. And it's my favorite of all the, what is it, 13, 14 episodes of Firefly. It's out of gas. But if they had showed it first and you see how Mal and it met... I mean, granted, that, they probably should have waited till like, second season or the end of the first well, season to show that, but they didn't have a chance. That, that we would like never have seen it. Well, it, I, I, it was hanging on the brink from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So it may be one of those that they would have shot at the very end of the season one or at the beginning of season uh -huh. two. But it's like, hey, we may not get another chance at this Admiral. But yeah, it, uh, 
It was what, interesting. What I, did you think? I'm sorry, I just keep talking and talking. Well, I liked the show. It was fairly action packed. It was very much a suspense type thing. And I wonder how different the tone from week to week will be because Joss basically got the idea when he's talking with, with Elijah about like what she does as an actress and how she's a different person every day and he comes up with this kind of an idea of people that really are a different person every day so the next time i mean this time around she was a i, I think she was a hostage negotiator right a hostage a negotiator, negotiator yeah so so you had that kind of suspense show built in but like what if the next show becomes a romantic comedy i don't know what you could go with it seems like it could bounce all over the place obviously i think there's going to be shows where she's rambo like that freaking uh, hot Asian chick from the end of the uh, the show was. Is she hot? Well, I particularly don't think so, but uh, obviously some people do because you already mentioned to me uh, earlier today that all the folks on the message boards thought she was hot. So, anyways, she looks like a Batman villain to me, but not Harley Quinn, Catwoman, Poison Ivy. One of the male Batman villains. <laughs> Just between you and me, that girl freaks me out. Yeah, me dude. too. But, but wait, yeah, wait, wait. so that girl was Rambo, and I think. You know, next week could be completely different. There could be one that's a romance. Okay, well, the, the only TV spot I remember that wasn't her naked with Los Angeles superimposed over That was the only thing I remember at all. Well, no, there, there was one. Her naked. Where there are these, these nasty gossiping women, and they're at a wedding. Oh, right. And some guy that they know that they think is a loser shows up with Echo on his arm. Uh-huh. And they're looking, and they're like, oh, look they're at that. And, and, and as stuff. they watch... They see the way that she's staring at him and all mm-hmm. that. And she's like, oh, she really loves him. You could tell. And to me, I was just like, holy cow, I can't wait to watch this show. Because she's not an actress. She's not Sydney Bristow on Alias pretending to love this guy. They have brainwashed her right. so that she does love this guy. And I thought, wow, that's, that's really cool. And we could talk about possibilities for future episodes. They could have one where she's a mom. They could have yeah. one where she's a school teacher. They could have one where she's a, a, a green man. beret. They could yeah. have one where, yeah, where she, where she instead of uh, you know somebody who was kidnapped is a kidnapper or something. It has uh-huh. to be absolutely cold and heartless could and go in and a grab a kid. Because you know? it could be a Silence of the Lambs kind of thing. And it's like the only way to track down this serial killer is to get a real serial killer's <laughs> mind. And yeah, that's been done before, but not by Joss. Let's go. <laughs> She could be a vampire slayer. Yeah, there you go. Who knows what kind of a show it'll be each week. I mean, last week's, I think, was a cop show almost. But um, in the theme song, they show clips from, I guess they have to be from future episodes. Uh, oh, of different incarnations. Right, of, of her shooting guns and I don't know what else she was doing. But I think there was one where she was wearing a red Michael Jackson jacket and breakdancing. But uh, yeah, speaking of that, what did you think of the theme song? Did you get any impressions uh, from it? Shoot, you know, I knew we were going to talk about theme songs. I can't remember. I, 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 do you have it handy? I, I can't remember the darn thing. I was paying attention. Bless you, sir. If I, I mean, I totally don't remember the tune whatsoever. But I remember it was just like some girl going like, la, 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 la. But the, my favorite part was the very, think, very end because they had like... that sweet Caroline. <laughs> that was close to almost exactly what I just sung. You were paying attention, if I can you tell. you play it back, that was <laughs> sweet Caroline's intro. Sweet Caroline. Okay, folks, I need you to call in. Here's our 800 number. Anyways, she sings la, 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 all right? But the best part of the theme song is at the very end, they have this little music box thing sounds i swear i heard it and i went hey that's creepy doll oh by jonathan Colton. <laughs> yeah it sounds so much like it it goes like bling 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 but i don't think it's unfortunately a very memorable one maybe after 150 episodes we'll, we'll really <laughs> you like imagine it. they make 150 episodes of this how many episodes of buffy did they make yeah something like that i don't know i mean i don't think it's especially memorable but it's not terrible either it's not like the ones that we're going to talk about today on our list I did look at the ratings and that, and it oh. it got fairly good ratings. It did better than Sarah Connor Chronicles, which was its lead in. But anyway, we'll, we'll cut up most of this out. But if you're listening to us and you have any interest in Dollhouse, I don't think you need to have seen the first couple episodes. Basically, she's a different person every week, so you can jump in yeah. at any time, and hopefully, you will not be lost. Here's a question for you. Speaking of ratings, um. I watched the show on the internet via the Fox website. Does that stuff get counted in as ratings, you think? 
It does not, but they probably count. They they, pro- they, they set it aside for their demographic people to come in. Uh huh. They probably uh, count it themselves and consider it a viewer, though, right? I bet you they can count better who watches on the internet than they can with real ratings because they made me log in and all this stuff. They have my name and my friggin' children's names and my address and my phone number and my credit card receipts. Length and, and girth, yes. <laughs> the, all that they care about, and you know this well, is advertising dollars. And yeah. advertisers are never going to care how many people downloaded it or how many people watched it on the they internet. They show commercials on it, although they were all commercials for The Simpsons this right. time around. So apparently they're in trouble for... So they may get the info, but it doesn't it doesn't matter to them all that much. Mm. As far as... It's too bad because I don't have a TV connection anymore. I have no satellite subscription. Well, folks, if, if you would donate like so much <laughs> money that we could pay for microphone stands pay our authors and have a little left over, I think Big could get back on television and start watching Pushing Daisies again. <laughs> Pushing Daisies is canceled. Oh, never mind. Don't okay. ever donate, folks. <laughs> okay, hey, so last week we talked about our favorite TV show themes. Uh-huh. And in the time since then, have you come up with others that you wish that you had put? Because I thought of the Laverne and Shirley theme. Oh, yeah. I love that song, but it didn't come to me. You know, there's some other ones that... Uh, I didn't mention, but I think are really cool too. Like Hawaii Five O is a good theme song, and you can have really good shows with lame theme songs. I mean, just between you and me, I never thought that the Buffy the Vampire Slayer theme was that good. I don't dislike the song itself, though. I think I'm more of a punk rock fan than you are, though. That's right, because when they did the Angel theme, and it's so traditional, and it's like cellos and stuff, I was just like, "Oh, now this rocks! I love that theme." <laughs> So you didn't like the Buffy theme, huh? No, oh, not really. There have been shows. It's interesting how much you love the show, yet you just dislike the theme. A lot of times I've found that the love for the show really makes the theme song better, but I guess in that case, not so much. Well, I don't know. I was going to say a lot of times... Well, okay, let's just take the very end of this podcast and talk about the theme songs that we dislike, the opposite of what we did last time. Okay. Um And yeah, let me just start by saying a lot of times if a show has a really lame theme song, it's probably not that good of a show anyway, and it's forgettable. Mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe one episode we'll talk about shows that we loved and shows that we hated. But for now, like, like I would love to be able to put Small Wonder on there because of all the shows that have ever existed... I hate Small Wonder the most. Wow. That's, that's, that's not an exaggeration. But I don't even remember the theme song because I hate Small Wonder that much. Dude, I will never. I have never watched an episode yeah, I don't all the way remember. through. I mean, I think I've seen an episode through, but I do not remember the song whatsoever. That show makes me want to kill. <laughs> if there was a sharp object near me right now, you would be cowering in fear right now just from the mention of Small Wonder. But it's not on my list because I, I don't know how the theme went. Right. I mean, who cares? So what is the first one on your list? Oh, you can guess. Because we mention it more than any theme song, even more so than the Firefly theme. It's the theme to Smallville, isn't it? It totally is. You and I watched every single episode of Heroes together from the very beginning. And starting in like the third or fourth episode, because they don't have a theme song, they have a theme sound. (laughs) They have one tone and the logo comes up. But I started doing it, and I still do it. Every single time that damn hero's symbol comes up, I go, Somebody say! Well, anyway, I'm not a fan of the theme tune. and But you like the show, don't you? That's the weird thing, is from the pilot on... Gosh, why do I use the word pilot? I don't know. That's, a, that's what they're that's called. That's an industry word. From the first episode on, I was a fan of that show. I saw you know first airing of that show on the WB, and my roommates and I, we would get together, and my roommates would invite all their girlfriends over, and there, so there'd be tons of new girls every week, because I had those kind of roommates. But very much like you, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we would always watch Smallville. But I would wince every time that somebody save would me just start. And then the worst, the nadir, if you will, of Ooh. the whole experience was the season finale of that first season. The band that sings that song plays at their prom. <laughs> and Pete Ross goes, Clark, Remy Zero. And he points at him. Oh, oh, it was so terrible because the band was named Remy Zero. I think that may... Isn't that a guy? And guess what? They sang the Smallville theme 
on Smallville at their prom. I just it must I, have been a I nice had, prom. I had to get that out. It was actually a really good episode. And yeah, what's weird is so just recently, just two thousand nine, mm. I've started watching it again. And yeah, after that fourth season, it's gotten really, really good. But that same that theme, song just I have to put away. up for it every time. And you know what? I know there are people that just love it. But oh, yeah, uh, funny story. Now that you mention that, my brother-in-law is a big fan. He's a huge Superman nut, and I mean, he must like the song because when he got married to my sister, I did a little wedding video for them. And you know, I did the whole crap where you put the pictures up of them as they're growing up and getting older and all that stuff. And you start when they're babies until they're older. And he asked specifically for this Remy Zero song to go over his pictures. And I even tried. I was like, you know, it doesn't really flow so well with your pictures. It's not a romantic song. And I said, maybe you should. What about... Like REMs. I can't stand fly. <laughs> well, I actually suggested REMs. I am Superman, and I can do anything. Yeah, but he didn't want to that. Said, no, no, I just, I just want that. Remy Zero. It's my favorite. They're going to be playing at my prom too. So, <laughs> some people like it. I remember at your sister's wedding that you, right when when it was a time to cut the cake, he pointed and said, "Remy Zero." <laughs> yeah, that was a bad moment. So, uh, first thing on my list, and this is a show that, I mean, I like it a fair amount. I'm not like a fanatic or anything like that, but it seems like it's hard to find anybody who dislikes the show very much. But Seinfeld has such a crappy theme song. Can you do it? Just, and then they play those stupid sounders in the show, too, in between, like, when they do scene breaks. Oh, gosh, I hate it. It's so lame. I don't know if you feel the same way, but I think it sucks. But what do you think? Do you hate the song as much as I do? I don't know that I hate it as much as you do, but as far as the show goes, you know what? I'm just going to go out there. I don't care if people are offended. Most overrated television show of all time. Wow, of all time. I don't hate Seinfeld. I like Seinfeld. I've liked several of the episodes. Can't stand Kramer, but I, <laughs> I like the other characters. I, George Costanza is freaking great. <laughs> but, dude, people parade around like that is Christianity of the 20th century. <laughs> No, but I'm just saying, people are so zealous about Seinfeld, and it's just, and it's like, you know, I'm willing to die for Seinfeld. I make the sign of the Feld, and all that, and I was just like, dude, calm down, man. I just, yeah, anyway. I like the show, and I think sometimes it's funny, but it's interesting because they show these characters and bad things happen to them, and I don't really care because every one of those characters are not likable people. None of them are nice. None of them you ever feel bad about when, I don't know, whatever bad thing happens to them. And maybe that's kind of the point of it. And I think that is, you know, the the final episode, they'll get thrown in jail because they violated the Good Samaritan Act or something like that. That's true. Yeah, that's right. So what other songs do you have on your list, Rish? Okay, number two on my list is Boston Legal. Again, a show I love. Yeah. William Shatner. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you would love it. I'm a member of, of the official William Shatner fan club. Let me see your membership card. It's got this, I don't know, I just always found it like this overbearing, really obnoxious, I think Danny Lux did the theme. But I was going to say, I wouldn't be surprised if the same guy did the Seinfeld theme that did that. (laughs) And one time I was working on Boston Legal, and it happened to be the day of the week that the show came on. Mm -hmm. And we were going to be working late that night, so we were going to miss the episode. So they said, well, everybody, we'll we'll take a long lunch, and we're going to wheel in a couple TVs, and we have a tape of tonight's episode, and we're going to watch it. We can all watch it and we're ordering food for everybody kind of thing. So Sounds like fun. It, it was really cool. And, yeah, it was the only time that that ever happened. Um, mostly, I guess, because we were usually done Before relatively sure, early. Yeah. But, uh, okay, so we all gathered around and we watched the episode together. And, you know, four minutes in, that theme started up. And I was like, ugh. And this dude next to me is like, oh, yeah, best part of the show is this song. Oh, yeah. I mean, he was, again, a religious experience for this guy. He was digging it, man. And, yeah, it was just one of those where it's like different strokes for different folks, dude. There's a good theme song. Oh, yeah. The world don't move to the beat, just one drum. That's definitely one we missed last week. We should have we should have included that one. Different strokes for different folks. I hate that theme, and he loved it. That was his favorite part of the show. Hey, what is your number two? My, uh, my number two, you know, I talked last week, one of my top favorite songs of all time 
was the original series of Battlestar Galactica. The and bad now one. I have to acknowledge the other Battlestar Galactica series. The theme song just sucks. It's almost like Heroes, where they just have a sounder or whatever as their theme. It's just like those ladies going, And, dude, it's just awful. And I remember, I think the first season, and maybe this was only in America, they had a different theme song, which wasn't any better, but it was different, and then they switched it over to this new crappy song. Which was the international version from the, the very yeah. beginning. They said, well, this one's much better than the other one, so let's use that. And it sucks, too. Then they do go into some kind of... Tribal rhythm. Yeah, the little tribal thing when they show you the uh, and, and all the stuff. Goes, yeah. yeah, they show you all the stuff that's coming up in the episode you're about to watch, which uh, we generally skip. I hate when they do that on Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> right. Why know. would they show you what you're about to watch? I don't know. That, there might be a point like next week on Battlestar Galactica. Sure, because it gets your arse right back but in the not seat. like today in one minute on Battlestar Galactica. You will see these flashes. And I don't know. Maybe people make a game of that. And yeah. it's like, oh, while, they, while during the commercial they're talking about, okay, so did it look like Starbuck was kissing somebody? <laughs> Who was that? That would be the only circumstance under which I would actually watch those damn things. Yeah. When Incredible Hulk came out last summer, I thought it would be cool to watch the 70s TV show for a little, the Kenneth Johnson show. Uh-huh. And, and so I rented those. And they would have this tonight on Incredible Hulk. And it would be like a 30-second synopsis of the show you were about to watch. And I thought the Wrong. only two reasons I can see of doing that is so viewers instantly know whether it's a rerun they've seen or not. Well, and maybe. how stupid is that? You don't want them to know. You want them yeah, to watch the whole true. thing and be like, you know, I think we saw that Did one three months ago. Did we see this one? That's, that seems familiar. You know, a cool thing, though, that they do do in the start of the uh, Battlestar Galactica I love that they always update the number of survivors. Oh, that was really it's, cool. That's always fun. It would dwindle. Yeah, watch it dwindle or go, how much was it last week? You never, of course, can remember. But but yeah, the theme song <laughs> sucked. Okay, so we've reached the number one. And you know what? Again, this is going to be controversial because this is one of those shows. This is the 70s equivalent of Seinfeld. Greatest show ever made. Look at my tattoos with this show's friggin' logo on them. This is my absolute least favorite theme song. And I even know the name of the theme. The song is called Suicide is Painless. <laughs> and it's the theme song to MASH. Interesting story. That's my least favorite oh, song yeah! of all time as well. Yeah! Dude, that's so cool. It's such a terrible theme. You know, when I was a kid, that show would come on, and I would see, like, the helicopters, and you hear that... Dun, 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 dun. And I was just like, this is a show that like boring old grown-ups watch. And I never ever watched MASH. And I was more than 10 years old before I ever even realized that this show was a comedy. Not only does that theme song make me want to kill myself, just talking about it with you makes me wish <laughs> I were dead. Makes you wish that suicide really was painless. I, locally, it would come on right after the news. I don't know. If where you grew up, it did. But that would be the time I would go to bed. But I could hear that from my parents' bedroom, and they would watch it every single night instead of have sex. And it was just, you laugh. I'm sorry. Did you know that <laughs> that's how you and your ten yes, brothers and sisters yes, were yes, created? Yes. Yeah, I think my parents were even too young for this show. They didn't watch it. It was just this combination of utterly bleak and utterly old. An awful, awful, awful song. I hope I'm not offending our listeners listeners that love that show but that is what it makes me think of that song yes utterly old utterly bleak sad terrible awful why would anyone watch this show that's funny i feel closer to you because we both <laughs> happen to have that and we didn't collaborate yeah, that's true in fact i was a little bit afraid that you would say dude i love that song that's the best show dude now that show is the best show ever made <laughs> You know, the final episode of MASH is still the highest rated television show ever. It beats out any Super Bowl, any American Idol finale, any Oscars. It beats out any of those things, and by a long way. I have no understanding of this. Another little bit of trivia I've got for you. Oh, yes? More people have killed themselves during the theme of Song of MASH <laughs> than any Super Bowl or Oscars or Mary Tyler Moore or Jonas oh, Chachi. That's interesting. 
Well, folks, I meant for us to be talking for about five minutes, <laughs> and I don't know how long this podcast has been going, and I apologize if I've offended anybody, but at the same time, I retract that apology because I believe wholeheartedly in what I've just said. I look forward to seeing the comments that people have about these, these theme songs. Uh, yeah, if you want to drop in and leave a comment about your least favorite theme song, we'd love to hear it. If it's one that didn't make our list. Oh, and you know what? In case I haven't offended everybody, in case there's 1% of the audience, I liked the theme song to Enterprise. Dude, I'm out of here. See ya. Oh, wait. We need to finish. All right. So that's our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. You probably didn't, but that's okay. I'm Big Anklevich. <laughs> and I'm Rich Outfield. What might be right for you may not be right for some. A man is born, he's a man of means. Then along comes you. You got nothing but genes. It takes different strokes. It takes different strokes. It takes different strokes to move the world. Yes, it does. It takes different strokes to move the world. See you later, folks. <laughs> The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Take two. Sometimes I would go over to my grandparents' house. The mash would come on, and my grandma would be like, F*** this noise, and she'd switch the channel to Lawrence Welk because that was at least upbeat and for much younger folks. I did look at the ratings and that, and it, oh. it got fairly good ratings. It did better than Sarah Connor Chronicles, which was its lead-in, huh. and usually Fox is all about did it hold the audience, audience. from the lead-in or did it build on the lead-in. They used to say shit like that all the time. And it actually built on the lead-in. Um, it didn't do nearly as well as some effing turd called Super Nanny that's on ABC at the same time. Super Nanny was on again? Oh, dear God. That's but one of those shows it, that teaches you how to raise kids. Oh, it's not like they bring in the British woman and she's with these terrible little slums. Yeah, there's like terrible little slums. And they're like, yeah, you can't tell me what to do. And the parents of, are, are all effed up and they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. My kids are monsters. And Super Nanny's like, okay, you have made your child a monster. Here's what you must do. And then she teaches them how to deal with their kids. And then they, and then they start doing what the Super Nanny says. And then their kids become good kids again. Wow, that's... see. You're speaking as though you can that you like this show, but to I me, I actually do. Because out of all the shows on TV, sometimes the only one I would want to watch less than Super Nanny is my Super Sweet Sixteen <laughs> with the sixteen-year-old bastard. Child. See, that's because you don't have kids. But dude, I, I tell you, every person that has a child should be forced to watch that show every week because there are so many little bastard brats like the, that show. That it's it's because it's these parents of made them into these monsters and then they're like oh my kids are monsters it's like no you